Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. And I want to thank Greg for becoming our latest Patreon supporter at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Uh, You can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. You can also send along a one-time donation to support.greatdetectives.net by using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net, or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Dragnet, which was actually the 300th episode of the series. There's no acknowledgement of that in the episode, but to be fair, this is the Armed Forces uh, Radio and Television Service uh, version of the episode, so it may have been in the network broadcast, but that's not available. Uh, The original air date on this one is May the 17th, 1955. The title is The Big Squealer. Ladies and gentlemen, The story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile detail. You get a report that a teenage boy has been found in a downtown alley. He's in critical condition. Your job? Check it out. the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, November 16th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. We're on our way into the office, and it was 9.17 p.m. when we got to the second floor of Georgia Street Juvenile. The squad room. I don't know, Joe. What? You see a kid like that, you start wondering. Yeah. Fifteen years old, trying to hold up a liquor store. Kind of worries the guy. What do you mean? Well, about your own kids. How are they going to turn out? Well, most of them turn out okay. Yeah, I can't help worrying, though. Well, you're a father. Maybe you're better off, Joe, not having the worries. You really believe that? Well, I guess so. Well, why don't you stop trying to marry me off? Oh, say, that reminds me. Yeah? You know the Phillips? Live down the street from us? I don't think I do. They were over for dinner the same night you were. Yeah? Last summer, time Faye made fried chicken. Oh, yeah. Remember? I remember the chicken. Go ahead. You're going to spend Christmas with us, aren't you? Christmas. Faye told me to be sure and remind you. It's only a month or so off. That's soon, huh? Yeah. Can we count on you? Yeah, if we're not working. Swell. I'll let Faye know. What's this got to do with the Phillips? Mm, nothing. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with them, Joe. Why are you so darn suspicious? Which one of them has the sister? Huh? Come on, Mr. and Mrs., which one? Both of them, for all I know. Well, which one has a sister who's coming out here for the holidays? Which one? Mrs. Phillips. And they're all going to be at your place for Christmas dinner, is that it? Well, Faye hasn't asked them yet. She wanted to be sure that you... Mm-hmm. Okay to ask him? They're your friends. You won't regret it, Joe. You know Mrs. Phillips is darn nice looking. Good talker to her. For sisters, anything like Just she... Just do is. me one big favor, will you? What's that? Christmas is still five weeks away. Don't start selling me now. <laughs> I wouldn't try to sell you on any girl. You know that. You bet. I never even met this one. I was just thinking that sometimes you can kind of sort of judge a person by family and... Funeral Friday. Where's that? I see. Yeah. Found a kid lying in an alley off Sheridan Street. He's hurt pretty bad. An accident? Knife in his back. (laughs) 
Frank and I drove out to the address where the victim had been found. It was a dark alley that opened onto Sheridan Street in the block between 5th and 6th. An ambulance had been called, and the boy had already been moved to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. 9.42 p.m., we talked to one of the patrol car officers who had discovered the body. We're only a couple blocks away. We headed right over. Where'd you find him? Yeah, I'll show you. Right here against that wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, must have lost a lot of blood. Yeah. Knife still in him? Mm-hmm. Small of the back. Looked like he'd been beat up, too. You say anything about who did it? Well, he mumbled something. We couldn't understand him, and then he passed out. How old would you say he was? Oh, 15, 16, maybe. Uh-huh. He's a good-looking kid, about 5'8", black hair, blue eyes, regular features. What kind of clothes? A jeans and a jacket, windbreaker type. You see anybody around who might have done it? No, not a soul. The street was deserted. Mm-hmm. My partner's out looking now. I'll give him a hand. All right. Who filed a complaint? I don't know. Well, we'll check the board. I'm afraid that won't help. Hmm? Well, they don't know either. While a patrol car officer searched the neighborhood for suspects, Frank and I canvassed the area for the person who had reported the crime. 10.16 p.m., we talked to the patrons in the nearby bar and grill. They denied having any knowledge of the assault. 10.42 p.m., we entered a small tobacco shop on the corner of Sheridan and 8th. Evening, gents. How are you, sir? I do, sir. Uh, hi. What can I do for you? We're police officers. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Sam Crest here. Mr. Crest. Uh, something troubling you fellas? I'd like to talk to you for a minute, that's all. Done anything I shouldn't? No, sir, not as far as we know. Well, you never can tell, you know. The, the way they keep making up new laws nowadays, a person can be a criminal without even half trying. Mm-hmm. Too many rules. That's what's wrong with this country. Too darn many rules. Yes, sir. Ought to be just one. How's that? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Golden rule. That ought to be more than sufficient. Yeah. Don't work out that way, though. Man could live up to it every day of his life and still wouldn't keep him out of jail. Mm -hmm. Golden rule don't say nothing about paying income taxes or taking out licenses or filing Social Security reports. Well, does it? No, doesn't seem to. But you're in jail if you don't do them. Yeah. Man can live by the golden rule. Don't make no difference. It makes a difference. Oh, some maybe, but not enough. Have you been here all evening, Mr. Crest? Since supper time. When was that? 6.30. Eat at the drugstore over on Soto Street. Stop serving food at 7. I see, sir. What time did you get back to the store, do you remember? Oh, five odd, maybe. And you've been here ever since? Sure. You ain't doubt my word. No, sir. I tell the truth, you know. Yes, sir. I may not get all my government forms figured out right, but I'm a truthful man. Mm-hmm. Anybody suspicious come in here tonight? Suspicious? Mm-hmm. I'm afraid you'll have to explain that. You see, I ain't no policeman. Folks don't look suspicious to me. They just look like folks. Well, I mean, strangers then? Sure, lots of strangers. Eight or ten, maybe. I see. Strangers to me, leastways. I don't get acquainted with folks easy. Uh -huh. Man comes, buys a pack of cigarettes or some tobacco. Don't make him a friend. Uh -huh. Well, now, sir, had most of tonight's customers been in before. Oh, some of them had, yeah. Some of them hadn't. I don't keep track. I see. Did you hear anything out on the street? Traffic. Folks walking by. You fellas sure ain't very specific. Well, anything like a fight? In front of my place? In the neighborhood. Well, I didn't hear no fight. Somebody get to mixing it up? Looks that way. Oh, yeah, that's the trouble with this world. People always squabbling. Wherever you go, whatever you do, it ends up in squabbling. Mm. Who was it? We don't know yet. Anybody hurt? Yes, sir. Well, probably brung it on himself. Maybe. Were there any youngsters hanging around your place tonight, Mr. Crest? Youngsters? Teenagers. Well, if there was, I didn't notice them. Kids, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I just don't know what we're coming to. Well, thank you very much, sir. Sure. Good night. Good night, sir. Uh, say, uh, there was one. How's that? One young fellow. Uh, he didn't hang around, though. Uh, he was in a big rush. You know him? No, I, no, I, I don't think I ever saw him before. Could you describe him for us? Oh, just an ordinary kid. How big was he? Oh, not big. He come up to about uh, here on me. Mm -hmm. Probably don't have his full growth yet. Oh, I see. You recall how he was dressed? Well, I didn't pay much attention. Only in the shop a couple of minutes. What color was his hair? Light, reddish, or blondish. Nice looking boy? Oh, no better or worse than most. What time did you see him? Must be nearly a couple of hours ago, along about uh, nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. Come charging in all out of breath. Yeah. Asked if I had a phone. I pointed out the booth over there in the corner. Go ahead. Well, there's nothing more to tell. He run over the booth, made a call. Wasn't on the phone more than a few seconds. Mm -hmm. 
Then he come out and left the shop. Anything else you can tell us about him? Mm, I don't think so, no. Except that uh, when he was leaving, yeah. uh, he wasn't in a hurry like when he come in. He sort of peered out the door first. Mm-hmm. Seemed as though all the steam had gone out of him. He looked back over his shoulder. Yes, yeah, sir. Doggone expression on his face. What do you mean? Like he was scared to death. While we're in the tobacco shop, we telephoned Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and talked to Dr. Sebastian. He told us that the victim was in a critical condition and had been moved to General Hospital. He also told us that they'd not been able to identify the boy. We called General and asked to be notified when he was able to talk. 11.31 p.m., Frank and I went back to the office. Homicide was notified. Patrol car officers who had discovered the body reported that they had not found any suspects in the vicinity of the crime. 11.46 p.m., we checked with the crime lab. An examination of the weapon had revealed no useful fingerprints. It was a spring blade knife with an eight-inch blade. 12.02 a.m., Frank and I went off duty and another team of detectives continued the investigation. The next morning, Thursday, November 17th, 8.12 a.m. Morning, Joe. Hi. Anything new? No, not so far. How about missing persons? Nobody's reported them. It's funny. You'd think somebody would be looking for him by now, his folks or somebody. Yeah, you would. Mm-hmm. Any coffee in that thing? Yeah, help yourself. All right. It's probably cold by now. It's better than nothing. Did you miss breakfast? Yeah, I wasn't hungry. Oh. Oh, you're right. Huh? It's cold. Yeah. Say, hey, Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, about Christmas. What about it? Well, we won't invite Mrs. Phillips' sister if you don't want us to. Mm-hmm. No. I got to thinking last night people shouldn't force a guy to get married and raise a family if it's against his best judgment. Well, who's getting married and raising a family? It's just a Christmas dinner, isn't it? Yeah, but you know Faye. Well, you know me. I got it. Juvenile Friday. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Thank you very much. General Hospital, the boy's coming, too. Yeah? Can we talk to him? Yeah, for a minute or two. We better get a move on. Oh? Huh? Doc said to hurry. Frank and I drove out to General Hospital. A doctor in charge of the case was waiting for us in the hall outside the patient's room. Smith and Friday? Yes, sir. Is it all right to go in? Don't stay too long. All right. You're going to be all right, Doc? It's too soon to tell. If the wound was an inch higher, I could give you an answer. Yeah? He'd be dead. We went on into the room. The shades were drawn and the victim was in semi-darkness. His eyes were open, but he closed them as soon as he saw us enter. How are you feeling, son? Son? I'm okay. I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes. No way of stopping you, is there? What's your name, son? What's yours? Smith, Frank Smith. My partner's Joe Friday. Cops? That's right. Well? Well, what? How about telling us who you are? I forgot. Well... You know, amnesia. Yeah. How'd you get hurt, kid? Forgot that, too. We're trying to help you, son. Not my fault if I don't remember nothing. You know, you're pretty sick. Sure. But it's not amnesia. You a duck? No. Nope. And you tell what's wrong with me. Who knifed you? Now, what happened? Come on, what's your name? Abraham Lincoln. You guys can call me Abe. All right, we'll find out. Go ahead. What were you doing on Sheridan Street last night? That where I was? You want him to get away with it? Who? The fellow that stuck a shiv in your back? Now, who'd do a thing like that? That's what we want you to tell us. Hey, you know what? Hmm? It's all starting to come back to me. Tell us about it. There was this black sedan, see? Mm Mm-hmm. Great big job. Yeah. I was walking along the street, sedan pulled up beside me, 12 guys jumped out. Yeah. Told you it was a big job. Mm Mm-hmm. Six of them tried to grab me. All right, that's enough. But you want to know what happened. It was all wearing masks. I said that's enough. Sure. Now, you listen to me, son. We're going to find out who you are and who stabbed you. Sorry, I ain't in a position to offer a reward. You want your face in all the newspapers? What for? I ain't important. I said we're going to find out who you are. Well? Okay, if you want to play detective. Let's have it. Tom. Tom what? Marcotte. Where do you live? Diamond Street. What number? Apartment house, corner of Diamond Olympic, second floor in the back. Now, I suppose you tell us what happened last night. Guy jumped me, that's all I know. Who was he? I don't know, I never saw him before. You sure about that? Yeah. What'd he look like? I don't know, it was dark. Somebody your own age? Heck no. How old was he? 
30, 35. Why'd he pick you? I don't know. Must have thought I had some dough. You never saw him before. That's what I said. How tall was he? I don't know. Did you get a look at his face? Uh Uh-uh. Can you tell us anything about him? Nope. But you know how old he was. I got a feeling, that's all. Yeah. Where do you go to school? Taylor High. What year? Tenth. Any gangs in your school? I don't know. You don't belong to one, do you? Nope. You had any kind of trouble lately? What kind of trouble? With the other kids at the school. Can't you guys get anything straight? I wasn't a kid. Mm-hmm. Who do you live with, Marka? My old man. Where's your mother? Under a tombstone. We'll get in touch with your dad. What for? He might be worried about you. Want to bet. <laughs> Unable to get any additional information from the victim. We went back to the office and checked the name Tom Market through R&I. They had nothing on him. 9.47 a.m., Frank and I drew out to the address he'd given us. It was a two-story stucco apartment house, badly in need of repair. We went up to the second floor. Must be this one. Yeah. I don't hear anybody. Take it easy, will you? All right. What's all the pounding for? Market. Yeah? We're police officers. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. Well, what do you want? Come in for a minute. If you don't, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Oh, boy. My head's coming apart in shreds. Mm-hmm. Kind of tied one on last night. That's so. Haven't got an aspirin, have you? No, sir. Right not. Can of beer? No. Nope. No. Nope. That's what I really need. Usually keep a couple in the refrigerator for an emergency like this. Mm-hmm. But that kid of mine's been guzzling them again. We'd like to talk to you about your son, Mr. Market. Yeah? You know he didn't come home last night. Didn't he? Nope. No way of me knowing it. I work nights, drive a hack, don't get home at four or five. He leaves for school before I wake up. I see. What'd you pick him up for? He's not under arrest. Huh? He's in the hospital. Hospital? That's right. He was stabbed last night. Huh? Yeah. He's gonna be all right, ain't he? They don't know yet. Oh. We thought you might be able to help us. Help you? Yeah. Find out who did it. You know who your son's friends are? I don't know nothing about them. We don't... Well, we aren't very close. I see. Has he been worried lately about anything? Upset? Uh, no more than usual. How's he doing in school? Lousy. Oh. They always ask me to come down and talk to him. Principal, his teachers. What do they say about him? I don't go. Mm-hmm. I went a couple of times when he first came to live with me. Didn't do any good. That's so? I can't change him. Anything I tell Tom just rubs him the wrong way. So he's on his own. How long has your son lived with you? Three years. How about before that? He was with his mom. Yeah. She divorced me a couple of years after he was born. Took him with her. Mm-hmm. When she died, there was nobody else to look after him. He had to come back to me. Yeah. <coughs> I got to get me a glass of water. Only take a second. Yeah. Looks like the kid was right, huh? Huh? About his father. Well, maybe. She doesn't seem very upset. No. Just got to stop his drinking. Yeah. Never used to feel like this when I was younger. Is that right? Could go on a bat for two, three days, come out of it and feel okay. Can't take it anymore. Well, sir, we'll be leaving. If you'd like to see your son, he's at General Hospital. Tom asked to see me? He's pretty sick, Market. You talked to him, didn't you? That's right. He asked to see me? No, he didn't. <laughs> didn't think so. I guess I can't blame him for hating me. He figures I didn't want him after his mom died. Figured I had to take him. Yeah. Tried to tell him different. He didn't believe me. We just can't talk, Tom and me. Mm-hmm. Father and son living in the same apartment, like we speak a different language. Think I'd go down and see him? Well, that's up to you. He didn't ask for me. It's funny. There was somebody who hates you, your own son. Well, maybe you're wrong about him. Yeah, you see it in his face, his eyes, the way he talks. Every time I look at him, I can see it. Tom's the one who's wrong. Yeah. It's not his fault, but he's wrong. You wouldn't believe it on a stack of Bibles. Even you guys don't. What's that? That I love him. Frank and I drove out to the Taylor High School on Grand Avenue. 10.57 a.m., we interviewed the principal, James Wingor. He told us that Tom Market was a poor student and that he was difficult to manage. He also told us that the boy had a good mind and was capable of much better work than he performed. He was unable to throw any light on the knifing and suggested that we talk with the victim's homeroom teacher, Miss Nora Rollins. 
11.16 a.m., we interviewed Miss Rollins in a small room which adjoined the principal's office. I'm supposed to be giving an English examination during this period, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am. This will only take a couple minutes. You have a student named Tom Marcotte? Certainly. He's in my homeroom. What kind of a boy is he? Noisy. Lazy. Impossible to discipline. Similar to a number of the others. Mm -hmm. He's absent today, though. Yes, ma'am, we know. Has something happened to Tom? He's had an accident. An accident or a fight. Why do you say that? Hmm. Wouldn't be the first time. Has he had any fights lately? Came to school with a cut lip two or three weeks ago. Does Tom have any particular enemies? I really don't know. There are over 75 students in my homeroom. It's a little difficult to know very much about any of them. Yes, ma'am. How about friends? Who's he pal around with, do you know? Nobody in particular, as far as I can tell. It... No, wait a minute. There's one boy. Ma'am? Arthur Jollett. What does he look like? Well, he's small, red-haired, almost as troublesome as Tom. Is he in school today? I believe so. Well, ma'am, is there anything else you can tell us about Tom? No, except that I don't have much hope for him. How's that? Well, I've asked his father to come in and see me several times. So far, he's always declined the invitation. Real? Is Tom badly hurt? Yes, ma'am, pretty bad. What was it? Knife wound. No. Seventeen years ago, when I first started teaching, that would have shocked me. I see. It was a very naive young lady, Sergeant. Is that right? I thought all a person had to do to become a teacher was to take the right courses, get a degree and a credential. Mm -hmm. It seemed such a simple matter. I wanted to teach English literature, so I studied English literature. Shakespeare, Chaucer, Browning, Keats, Shelley. Yes, ma'am. As I continue in the profession, I discover that I omitted one essential course. What's that? Judo. We asked Mr. Wingor if we could interview a student named Arthur Jollett. He asked his secretary to have the boy sent into us. Sounds like he's the one who called in the report. Yeah. Must have been with Marcotte when it happened, huh? Come in. You want to see me? That's right. Come in, son. You're Arthur Jollett, huh? Ain't that who you asked for? Sit down, son. We're police officers. This is Smith. My name's Friday. Do you have a friend named Tom Marcotte? I know him. Pretty good friend of yours, is he? He's a friend. You been with him lately? When? Yesterday, day before? Sure. Where? Here. We've got some of the same subjects. How about after school? Uh-huh. You saw him after school, did you? Night before last. Last night, too? Uh-uh. Where were you last night? Movie. Well, who'd you go with? Went along. What movie? Double Bill in Hollywood. What'd you do afterward? Just to ride on. Spend any time around Sheridan Street? Where's that? You want us to show you? Huh? Come on, we'll take you over there. What for? I'd like to have you meet a man who runs a tobacco shop in that part of town. You kidding or something? Young fellow came into his place last night. So? The way he described him, it could be you. He must be blind or something. Well, let's find out. Come on. Come on. Okay, so maybe I was in his neck of the woods. What's the beef? Your friend Market was around there too, wasn't he? Coincidence? Yeah. What's the matter with Tom, anyhow? Why? He ain't been in school today. He's in the hospital. Oh. It's a good thing you called us when you did. He might be dead by now. Who says I called you? Man who runs the tobacco shop. How the heck could he tell it? Well, I mean, who I was calling. All right, Jollop. Give us the whole story now, will you? What story? Come on, let's get it over with. If it's about Tom, ask him. We're asking you. You want us to take you in? Of course not. It's up to you. Ain't much to tell. Just walking around, Tom and me. Yeah. The fellow jumped out from an alley, came at us with a knife. Go ahead. Took a swing at Tom. I ducked off. Yeah. Called the cops. That's all I know. Who was it, Jollop? Your guess is as good as mine. We don't think so. Suit yourself. I thought Tom was a friend of yours. He is. Well, we want to know who stabbed him. What do you expect me to do? Dream up a name? How big was he? Medium size. How old? 19, 20. Tom says he was about 35. Tom ought to know. He's a lot closer to him. All right. Let's go down to the juvenile bureau. What for? I told you everything I know. I want to show you some mug shots. Forget it. I wouldn't recognize his picture. Let's give it a try anyway. I'll take it easy, will you? What's the matter? I don't want to be seen leaving with you guys. Is that right? Wouldn't do my reputation any good. Who are you afraid of? I ain't afraid. The guy who knifed your buddy, is that who you're afraid of? Look, if Tom wanted you to know, he'd have told you, wouldn't he? Tom ain't dead. All right, come on, Jollop, let's go. Give me an answer. Is Tom okay or not? Does that make any difference to you? Sure, it makes a difference. It doesn't look like it to us. I'm no squealer. All right, you've had your chance. Now you gotta go in. Come on. You can't arrest me. A boy was stabbed last night. You saw it. As far as we know, you're the only other person who was there. Now you figure it out. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Tom will tell you so. You throw me in jail, my old man will kill me. Well, that's tough. I ain't going to take the rap. It's up to you. Okay. Okay, it was Jerry. Jerry who? Longer. 
He go to this school? Yeah. What was it all about? Uh, Tom tried to date Jerry's girl. Jerry heard about her. Followed us last night. I'll get a hold of Longer. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. If Jerry finds out I squealed on him, he'll do even worse to me. He ain't gonna find out, is he? We won't tell him. If it tumbles, you can start sending flowers. Jerry's the big man around school. Yeah. Or six foot, lots of muscle, lots of shove. Well, that doesn't make him a big man, does it? Huh? He needs a knife. <laughs> The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 2nd, a hearing was held in Juvenile Department, Superior Court, State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that hearing. Petitions were filed on both the victim and the subject. The victim, Thomas Marcotte, was placed under 24-hour supervision in a foster home. The subject, Jerome Longren, due to a previous juvenile record and the viciousness of the attack, was sentenced to a juvenile correctional establishment. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Welcome back. Well, this episode is another one I'd forgotten, but actually was really good in quite a few ways. I did like the little conversation between Friday and Smith at the beginning of the episode, where Smith admits to being troubled by some of the cases that he's dealing with, making him wonder about the world, about his own kids, and giving this offhanded remark to Joe that, you know, maybe he's better off. And then Friday uh, kind of takes that as then maybe you'll stop trying to marry me off. And then Smith immediately begins with a plot to uh, marry Friday off. And in some ways it seems uh, contradictory. And there's definitely a humor to it, but I also thought it was really good from a character uh, perspective. And it kind of touches on, in a way, this idea of the challenge that policemen have in trying to uh, maintain a view of life and the world that is not just totally uh, dark. And so you get to hear Smith, who is usually a pretty upbeat character, or, you know, if he's downbeat at all, it's just, you know, stuff going on at home. But here... It's the stuff that I'm encountering on the job really makes me concerned for my own family. And, of course, uh, there's humor in the fact that he does shift to, you know, not so subtly planning this uh, matchmaking session for Joe. And I think certainly to Friday, he kind of sees that as a bit contradictory, you know, what you were just saying a minute ago. But I don't think what Smith was saying reflected the totality of his view of life. He was giving voice to a fear in a down moment. But still, Frank Smith is a really, a fairly upbeat person who's glad to have his family and thinks that it make Joe's life better if he settled down, got married, and had a family. I also do appreciate that uh, Frank did uh, kind of, you know, later on in the episode come back and, you know, was concerned that maybe he was pushing this a little too hard. But I think, you know, when you listen to uh, Friday, he's probably more amused. Occasionally uh, tilts towards... Uh, annoyance, depending on his mood, but not really angry or put off at all. And he knows that 
the reason that Frank and his wife are so determined to fix him up is ultimately because they care. So it's an interesting dynamic from those few scenes. I also really enjoyed the characters in this because they really did feel uh, incredibly real. The father in this story, you know, he's not like some dads who are just, you know, con- you know, full of contempt or don't like the kid. He's not really selfish or arrogant. You get the feeling that the guy is a bit in over his head, but wants to do right and just can't figure out how to do it. And the kids we hear from, you know, they have the same sort of stories. So this definitely feels like, you know, real characters as opposed to a caricature. So this is pretty well done in that regard. Listener comments and feedback now, and we have this from Mark, who writes, Hi, Adam. I'm really enjoying this week uh, with one of my favorite actors, uh, referring to last week's uh, Jack Webb Centennial Week, uh, the laconic Jack Webb. I love all of his series, and when he was on Escape as well as Suspense, his dry wit uh, comes through all the time. My favorite is definitely Pat Novak for Hire. I love how he relates to Tudor Owen's character. The writers of all these shows are excellent, uh, no doubt. The dry wit comes through all the time on these shows. Nice job this week. My least favorite series uh, he is in is Pete Kelly's Blues. It seems so sad, maybe because the music at the beginning of each episode is so down. Yet the skill of Webb shines through there, too. Well, thanks for the comment, Mark. And I definitely agree that Pete Kelly is a lot more of a downbeat series. And it definitely goes into the music, which, for many people, is its great appeal. Because Webb absolutely uh, loved uh, blues music. Uh, Part of his early radio career was as a DJ for a jazz and blues uh, uh, hour on uh, KGO Radio in San Francisco. Uh, so he was definitely huge into this, and that passion comes through. But it definitely does lead to more uh, downbeat stories. And I think probably the reason why it's more downbeat than Pat Novak for Hire is Pat Novak for Hire, uh, you would have a high body count. You know, the whole of San Francisco, you know, would be riddled with, you know, three, four corpses. But you never really, except in the case of the series finale, really got to know and care for any of these characters. They were there, and it was just for uh, a setup for Pat Novak to deliver dialogue. With Pete Kelly's blues, you have, you know, Probably less deaths overall per episode, but there's more of emotional stakes, and so you feel the impact of those deaths greater. So, in many ways, that makes for better drama, but it also is a bit more down, and so I can definitely get uh, why a lot of people uh, don't uh, uh, prefer it for that reason. But thanks so much uh, for the comment, Mark. And I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day as well. I want to go ahead and thank Greg. Uh, Greg has been uh, one of our Patreon supporters since uh, February, currently supporting us at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Greg. And that will actually do it for today. Uh, Join us back here on Monday for Box 13. Next Saturday, we'll be back with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.